Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first of three Honors College sneak previews for our amazing fall 2021 signature seminars. And tonight I'm thrilled to have my Honors colleague, Professor Noah Billig from the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design, who will be teaching a fall signature seminar on the super hipster and important topic of sustainable cities. And since we have a lot of honor students out there, notice that you do have to apply for these seminars. And the goal there is that we wanna keep the class to a discussion size, so 12 to 15 students. But also we wanna make sure we have a super interdisciplinary crew. So we want the engineer sitting next to the historian, circling around back to the Faye Jones School of Architecture, hitting the Bumpers College and zooming back again to the Walton College. We want all six undergraduate colleges represented at Dr. Billig's seminar table. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Linda Kuhn. I'm Dean of the Honors College and I appear to be also interim Dean of Libraries. Where am I? Who am I? No, I'm all right. Um, I'm hanging in there. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you the director of the Faye Jones School of Architecture Honors Program. And I would say that Professor Billig has been instrumental in totally reimagining the super successful, very rigorous, and always intriguing honors program in design over in Faye Jones. But Professor Billick, who has a PhD, he is an associate professor of landscape architecture and planning. He teaches really cool stuff. By the way, I've always enjoyed being on NOAA's honors thesis committees because they're, they're very graduate level. They're super innovative. And if you have a chance to take this class or another class with Professor Billick, I highly recommend it. Well, Professor Billig has actually lived abroad and practiced abroad in Turkey and Italy and also in Austria and Vienna. He lived in Istanbul. He's practiced also in Minneapolis. And I recall that you are a native Minnesotan. Is that right, <laughs> Professor Billig? Um, his work focuses on environmental justice, generative design, and perceptions of environments. And his research takes away significant meaning from ecological and generative processes, both social and physical, to address some pretty serious problems um, with resilient approaches for cities and landscapes. So what you're gonna hear tonight is about a vision for the city of the future, or so we hope <laughs> that this will be a great uplift of a lecture. After Professor Billy gives his lecture, and he's got beautiful slides for us, our amazing Honors College ambassadors, Duru Erlon and Maisie Kennedy, will actually moderate the question and answer session. So take it away, Professor Billick. Oops, yeah, I'm mute. <laughs> there we go. I didn't realize I was muted. So th thank you for such a kind and warm introduction, Dean Kuhn. Um, thank you to the Honors College, um, Dean Kuhn, Dr. Treat, um, Curley, or promoting this and supporting me in this um, endeavor. And then also, of course, thanks to the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design and all of their support um, in this and other, other endeavors with honors and in landscape architecture. Um, so this course uh, preview, I, I see this as more of a provocation for action from students and, and others, but there, there might be more questions that come from this lecture than answers. 
Um, but maybe that's the way it should be when we have a seminar next fall you know, to look forward to. So um, as Dean Kuhn mentioned, I've lived in, in um, Istanbul, Vienna, Austria, and Minneapolis. Um, I've also lived in mid-sized cities like Fairbanks, Alaska, and Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I currently reside. And I'm from a small town, Little Falls, Minnesota. So when, I, we, when we talk about urbanism, I, I include the small towns too. So it's a, we'll, we'll um, have questions of urbanism at all scales. Um, so this course is really it consists of four parts. So it, it'll, um, and four objectives. So it, it will have students investigate the systems and layers of the city and, and all their complexities. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. And then we're, we'll spend a fair amount of time looking at key challenges for sustainable cities. And that will roll into strategies for those challenges, right? And we'll talk about some of those um, challenges and some of those complex strategies tonight. Um, but then importantly, um, this class will also have the opportunity for students not only to offer um, discussion in the, the seminar format, but also um, opportunities to have project-based learning um, in the last third of the course at least, where we, we um, put our minds together and put our disciplines together and disciplines outside of design and planning to create strategic proposals for sustainable cities. And what that looks like is, is um, partly up to the students in the class as well. So um, when we look at sustainability, of course, we um, understand this as a, the environmental capacity, economic needs and social needs of a, for a sustainable city. And so this course takes that perspective um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that today, but it also takes a perspective from um, Godshock, a, a planner who's written a, a great deal on, on land use planning about what he calls the community sustainability prism. And this prism really looks at um, not just um, the environment, the social aspects and economy, but really looks at the goals of, of urbanism and communities as livability, um, sound ecology, sound economies, and equity. And with this, which, what, I, what I think is really interesting is he identifies different conflicts, right? So we see this if, you've, if you follow projects, whether it's locally in Fayetteville or in larger cities or in cities across the US, um, all, all development has some sort of conflict. So, and oftentimes they're conflicts that have equally um, important goals, but just different goals or goals that are in conflict with each other. So these problems get really complicated. And so we're going to investigate um, some of these conflicts, conflicts of gentrification, conflicts of, of green cities and green gent gentrification. So understand that when we talk about sustainability, um, it's of the, the magnitude of complexity gets a, a little bit higher when we start talking about sustainability in cities. Um, and in terms of systems, we will we'll talk a little bit about um, hydrology as, a, as an urban system, but tonight, but we'll, we'll look at systems of open space and public space, which of course is dear to me as with a landscape architecture perspective. Um, we'll look at systems of architecture and urban design, um, but we'll also look at economic systems um, and economic flows through city, um, social systems, social capital and community networks, and community organizations in a city, um, look at physical infrastructure systems, so engineered systems um, and for better or worse in a city. Um, we'll look at hydrologic systems, water flows, watershed context, and we'll look at habitat and flora and fauna systems as well in cities. So this is part of this background, um, first part of the course where we really start to 
um, reevaluate how we look at our environments. And if nothing else, the course should help you reevaluate how you look at your, your cities and you know, regardless of size. Um, but this, this also um, is a, cor a, a course that's really thinking of, sorry, there was supposed to be a little um, motion with this, <laughs> with this slide, but it's, so this course is seeing cities as a way to confront wicked problems. And a, a wicked problem, you may or may not have heard of this, but um, it, it's becoming more and more um, common in usage with um, issues like climate change. But a wicked problem is really a problem that is incredibly complex and doesn't have a easy um, starting or stopping point. And so, There it goes. So the, um, this was this was um, the, the phrase was coined in the 1970s um, by at least partly by planners, but this you know, really gets to the heart of a lot of our issues today. So climate change is a is a classic wicked problem where there's there's no one right answer, um, one answer or one action. Um, might be incomplete, but um, necessary to take certain actions, but then there's interdependencies that make one action um, act, act on other actions. So it's, they're incredibly complex. And so we'll, we'll address a number of wicked problems and how cities can both address, address wicked problems, um, but then also how cities have their own um, wicked problems as well. And so there's a, there's a number of different ish, interesting um, and urgent city issues. So some of these are specific to cities and some of these are um, ways that cities can um, help ameliorate the concerns of things like climate change. So we'll talk about some of these tonight. So issues of urban sprawl, of unequal access to land and environmental injustice, um, vacant lots, resiliency in the face of climate change, threats to water, threats to um, habitat and, and land and countryside, um, lack of public space, um, single use zoning that, and its limitations, lack of walkability, um, loss of a sense of place and informal urbanism. So it's um, also a course that's going to really in questions of urbanism and look, look critically um, at what a city can be. And so recently, well, I guess almost 10 years ago, Edward Glazer, the economist, was talking about the triumph of the city, right? And, and others have talked about, both, of course, historically, but then also recently, of the city as sustainable. And, you know, if we, if we think of per capita resource output, um, cities can be more sustainable than other other ways of living. So density has its benefits, but there's also benefits um, of being um, making us richer, smarter, greener, healthier, and happier. And so we'll look at this and we'll critique it um, and see some of the other um, recent authors on this, like David Miller's 2020 book that sees cities as the solution to our climate crisis. It's one of the keys to fixing the climate crisis. So so we'll look at the benefits of the city. We'll look at the cities as part of the solution um, and sometimes counterintuitively part of the solution. Um, we'll also look at um, some of the great urbanists. So Jane Jacobs, of course, so as, as one of those. And um, we'll, we'll see this slide again today, but it's, you know, Jane Jacobs was, was among other things, a great urbanist and um, advocate for cities. So she really called for what we would consider now to be sustainable cities and connecting to the people that live there, not just doing it from a, a 10,000 foot view that doesn't connect to the communities and the people on the ground. And um, we'll also critically evaluate city solutions. So this goes back to some of our, our conflicts, you know, that, that, that 
criticism that we I shared a little bit earlier. But on one hand, when, when I talk about sustainable cities, they there's hope, yes, but sometimes the hope isn't in, it's not always in green infrastructure and on like the image we see on the left, um, although green roofs and um, freeway parks and other green infrastructure and loan pack development can be really great, but there's also um, other ways that cities can be sustainable. And the, the other example is a, you see on the right is an informal settlement in Istanbul and we'll talk about how maybe counterintuitively informality, um, which is a ubiquitous form of urbanism, if you, if you think globally about how, how people are living, um, how that how it has its own um, beauty and how it has its own, how in many ways it can be um, sustainable. Um, doesn't mean it's always perfect, but we'll look at these kind of counterpoints of and, to, and different ends of the spectrum of of what can be sustainable urbanism. Um, so I need to take a, a brief detour into some history. And if we start to think of cities as systems, it's, it's worth noting that our history, and this is particular to, the, to US history, and apologies to those who have seen some of this in other coursework of mine or others, but um, it's important to understand that our way of urbanism um, is not an accident. It's, uh, it's based on policies that and practices that have been pra practiced for two generations, right? Or over two generations. So we'll look at some of the 20th century form, forms of urbanism here shortly. And in the course, we'll look at this more critically and more in depth and really try to um, get under the hood at, at the legacy both at the early history of this, but also at the legacies that are still with us. So um, just quickly, we had in, in, um, in new, the New Deal era and then through post-World War II America, there's a number of pieces of legislation. Um, one of the first of those was the FHA creation or the Federal Housing Administration created um, a Congress in 1934 under um, FDR administration. And it, you know, of course, this was part of the great uh, reaction to the Great Depression and the job losses. And importantly, though, though and what sometimes gets um, forgotten is that at the time we were really a, largely a nation of renters and home ownership was, was harder to come by. And so the, the, the federal government really starts the process of incentivizing homeownership and wealth creation through homeownership. And part of that is through the FHA. And so they had some, what seemed like laudable goals, but um, it was, some of the outcomes of it um, were not always so positive. So we'll, we'll look at some more of the, the details of that um, in the course, of course. But there's a FHA creation in 1934. And one of their functions is to ensure banks um, make um, ensure banks that make house loans to individuals, and then we also have the, the National Housing Act of 1937, which creates a low low rent public housing program. And um, I know there's a lot of text on these slides, but it's important text. So it you know by the late 1940s, um, there's large urban areas of housing being destroyed under the um, uh, under under the um, authority of the provided by the Housing Act of 1937, and then there's the GI Bill or Service Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944 that incentivizes homeownership um, for GIs. Um, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm going through this very quickly, but it's you know, just important to think about all the both both um, New Deal legislation and then post-World War II legislation that happens that really creates suburbanization as we know it and incentivizes people to move out of central cities and out of an urbanism that um, we really don't see in a lot of cities to this day in, in the US. Uh, but Title I of the Housing Act of 1949 really um, 
had a lot of power behind it and creates a slum clearance program that um, on one hand mandated low, um, low or moderate income rental housing, but the, the original target of 800,000 units was never really realized. So urban, you know, this was all part of urban renewal and using eminent domain to, to claim private property for civic projects. And this often, often was used to um, redevelop residential so-called slums and blighted areas. Um, but what this ends up doing is um, demolishing a lot of neighborhoods that were otherwise um, functioning in a lot of ways. And uh, we see this in city after city where um, cities are destroyed and suburbanization is incentivized. Um, and notably, of course, um, we see redlining as practice. Um, so that the, in 1935, this starts in the, the homeowners loan corporation looks at 139 cities across the country and um, creates residential security maps. And those um, oftentimes um, the, the neighborhoods that were redlined or were not secure for real estate investment were minority neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods. So uh, in city after city, we have redlining creating, um, eliminating opportunities for some and creating opportunities for others. And so it's really, a, um, it has, it's fundamentally changed the, our relationship with cities, right? And obviously redlining becomes part of this um, long-term legacy of city after city. And so we see it, I mean, you, there's a great resource at the University of uh, Richmond that has all, um, all the US red line maps digitized. Um, so you can easily access those, but the um, city after city, Kansas City, Dallas, um, my cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, all red lined, all um, ultimately creating disinvestment in central cities you oftentimes African American or other minority, largely um, minority communities. And Little Rock, of course, is no exception. And this has um, really devastating effects for Little Rock. Um, at the same time, we start to see a change in suburbanization in America. So the, the early suburbs of pre -war, um, World War II um, are, are about to change, right? So we love town. Is the, is the suburb that really starts this, where the suburb is seen as a commodity and there's a um, lack of infrastructure that we've seen in previous suburbs and in cities. And so it's, we start to see the tract home without provision of public open space, without other um, mixed use development. And this, is, this happens outside New York, but then it spreads throughout the country. And so, well, in the course, we'll, we'll look at this and kind of look at suburbanization and both some of the, um, the negative rap it sometimes gets from urbanists, but then also try to dive a little bit deeper into the history of suburbanization and um, look at some pre key precedents. Um, and then along with this, and so these are all working together. Um, we also have, of course, the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956, which creates our, our um, interstate highway system, right? So this is a hugely subsidized um, investment in the automobile and the infrastructure behind the automobile. And importantly, um, a lot of this connects to um, different urban renewal legislation where freeways are put through neighborhoods. And it wasn't, um, originally it didn't necessarily have to happen that these freeways went through central cities, but they did go through central cities in most cases and typically went through neighborhoods that were poor um, and minority neighborhoods. So this further um, causes problems in the neighborhoods and it also causes problems with, um, it, it causes problems um, with providing access to the suburbs. So, one of the issues with road building is that the, it's what we call a traffic generation effect. And so we traffic engineers have known this for 
for decades. That the more roads we build, eventually the more cars that fill it up. And so what might temporarily alleviate traffic congestion actually in, in the medium term and long term creates more traffic congestion. And so we've become this um, interstate highway system, but then not just the interstate highway system, but the, the um, all the highways around metropolitan areas across the country start us on a kind of a conveyor belt of traffic congestion. And the idea that we need to keep building more lane miles and it just makes us more sprawled out. And so it's, it's been a huge um, infrastructure investment, dollar investment, um, but ultimately has just made us more congested. So it's one of these counterintuitive uh, facets of planning that, that we'll, we'll look at in more detail too and, and see some examples um, in the course where people have ripped down freeways and, and traffic isn't necessarily create, more traffic um, is not created. Sometimes it can actually alleviate traffic. Um, so you know, these are issues of justice, right? So, and the, we'll, we'll look at some of the, um, some readings, including the color of law, and it looks at this history and, and has some really um, gripping stories of people, some people being left out of wealth generation of cities and some people being um, subsidized with wealth generation. And we'll look, we'll look at this history in more detail. Um, we'll also look at some of the, the other iconic city builders. Um, of course, Robert Moses um, in, in New York and what he did in New York and him and his colleagues did in New York has repeated in, in various ways across the country. And then some of the modernist ideas of people like Corbusier as well, the architect. And you know, ultimately a lot of what happens is traditional urban fabric, um, relatively low scale is demolished and replaced with what you know, the, the towers in the sky of the modernist architect. And we'll, we'll talk about the negative um, aspects of those as well and some of the costs in urban areas of, of this. But um, importantly, this history, um, we'll, we'll see some of the consequences of this, but it also have people that, that said we need to um, stop this, right? So there was advocate Jane Jacobs who stood up to Robert Moses um, in Greenwich Village in New York City. And of course, there's also other people calling for environmental justice and you know, including the environmental protection agency. So environmental justice is simply um, the, the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people. Um, so it's a key issue. It's not if we're talking about sustainable cities, um, it can't just be environmentally and economically sustainable. It has to include environmental justice. And it's, I think people are really surprised when they realize how, how connected this history is to current issues of environmental justice. Okay, and then we're also left with um, two generations really of suburban sprawl and a lot of late 20th century suburban sprawl and suburban sprawl the last um, the last two decades as well. But simply put, so, um, you, you may have heard this term or most of you probably have, but it's you know, often seen as a pejorative term, but it's, it's simply, we can simply define it as a spreading of development on undeveloped land near a city. Um, and it has, um, it can, it has a, a number of negative consequences or Ne negative attributes. So one of those are, is loss of countryside, including habitats, um, biodiversity loss. Um, it has a cost to local governments, and particularly if we look in the, in the long term, um, this is something that's often overlooked by people who are advocates of sprawling environments or who want to be able to choose for that 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 environment. Um, there's along with this cost to governments, um, there's also infrastructure liabilities that are often not 
paid or if they do get paid, they, they don't have the tax revenue to service those. Um, and there's a loss of sense of place. There's a dependence on automobiles and fossil fuels, which is certainly not sustainable. Um, and then it's connected to health problems. Our, our cities, our environments are connected. Some people connect it with obesity um, and other health problems. And then there's a, there are a number, a number of other environmental impacts, including um, public safety from issues like flooding and lack of walkability and other, other issues. So we'll, we'll dive a little deeper into some of these negative aspects, but um, we're gonna change gears here a little bit and look at a, a city system that might not intuitively um, seem like a city system. Um, but it's, so one of the, and I'm, I'm just using this as a sample, but one of the things we'll look at is uh, the systems of hydrology. And one of those things we'll look at is understanding a, the hydrology context. And so if, if we're looking at um, cities, we should know where we're, you know, where we're getting our water from, where we're getting our drinking water from, how much water um, the, the city gets. How, you know, how that flows through, through the network, through the water network, but also just what is this larger context? It's really important for um, approaching things in a sustainable way. And part of that is a regional watershed context. I think um, Fayetteville is really interesting as an example. In, and we'll, um, particularly, assuming we have this class in person, we'll be able to go investigate some of the local context from a hydrological perspective. Um, but this is a this is part of the a sustainable city is understanding this watershed context. And Fayetteville incidentally has a um, is on the edge of uh, two regional watersheds that have um, really different consequences. One goes into Oklahoma and one one goes into Beaver Lake, which is the main drinking source of or, or water of main source of drinking water. Um, but what's pretty cool from a place making standpoint is that that edge of that watershed actually cuts through campus and cuts through old main lawn and old main building. So it's, I, and I think this is part of the, the landscape architecture perspective too. We're, we're really interested in landscape legibility and place legibility. And part of that is understanding um, where you are in this larger watershed and both regional watersheds and then smaller watersheds as well. And along with city systems and sustainable water, there's also how we manage water and how we, how we, um, how we can design and plan and engineer with water. And so typically we think if we want to think in a broad, in a broad sense, we think of water quantity and water quality as two keys to for management in a city. Um, and you know, so this involves reducing runoff, reducing sources of, of water, and then reducing pollution and adding value to water quality as well. Um, and we'll, we'll see some, quickly see some examples of that um, in a few minutes. But yeah, so we'll, this, the course will, and I'm not a hydrologist, but we'll think about urbanized watersheds as well and think of that as part of the system of understanding. Yeah, so this is, this is where it'd be great to have some engineers Around or others who are um, maybe a, a restoration ecologist or some someone else who's, who's looking at this at, um, more broadly at sustainable water and really you know there's how can we have a sustainable water when impervious surface increased impervious surface of urbanism can reduce water um, water quality and water and increase water quantity which has negative consequences but. There's ways, and we'll look at ways of designing and engineering and ways of rethinking our, our engineered systems into designing for multi, um, multifunctional habitats and water systems. And you know, really thinking, I think, really thinking in, in interdisciplinary ways. So um, for the last, um, 10, 10 to 15 minutes here, I'm, I'm going to just go over some 
strategies in for sustainable cities. And again, this is provoking more questions and I, you know, again, providing answers for today, but it's some strategies, certainly from, these are from uh, urban planning and landscape architecture and urban design perspective, but there's all of these strategies are, are things that need multiple disciplines and multiple perspectives. So um, again, we, we know our development patterns just from a, a suburban sprawl standpoint have a lot of negative consequences. Um, by the way, on a side note, these negative consequences um, don't have to be, um, we don't have to draw, draw these as political um, consequences, right? So that, in other words, it, there's people on both sides of a political aisle that would find these negative. So there's a lot of, there's, you could say a fiscal conservative would really have a lot of um, arguments against our development patterns. And so we'll, we'll talk about that too and look, look critically, you know, to um, add the questions we're raising. So we know about designing good places. So we just look at the human scale here. We have, we understand um, good public spaces, good public squares are important for democracy. Um, they're important for gathering and We've lost sight of this in a, in a lot of urban areas and don't, um, don't provide adequate, adequate um, investments in this. Of course, we know um, some of this is, you know, happens of course in the, the squares and piazzas of, of um, Europe and other world cities, but there, there's also examples in the US. And you notice here when we talk about 10 principles of good public spaces and squares, it's not, part of it, it's about design, part of it's about programming, but it's also, it's not just a design strategy or just a planning strategy. It also involves funding sources. It involves good management, it involves image and identity. It involves program. Um, and there, there's a lot of things that, a lot of thought that is, um, has to happen to make things that are really function well that go beyond just the physical characteristics of it. Um, and we have examples in the US, you know, larger squares, public spaces, but we'll also look critically at why we're not doing that, you know, why, why this is sometimes the best we can, we can get. And I think um, one of the things we've noticed with COVID-19 is that our lack of um, adequate public open spaces, whether it be parks, trails, or other types of public open spaces in a lot of our cities. Some cities are, are better equipped than others, um, including Fayetteville, or someplace. in some ways we're, we're doing really well, but in other ways um, it's not good enough. And when you start spending enough time in your neighborhood and relying on the pedestrian network within you and, and bicycling network within your own neighborhood, you start to realize um, some of the inadequacies in that. Um, so we'll look critically. We'll also look at um, some issues regionally. So cities are interesting. We have um, cities that are shrinking or have shrunk. And in the case of Northwest Arkansas, um, we're burgeoning, right? And, and we're expected to hit a million people in the next 20 to or 25 to 30 years. Um, what does that growth look like? And what are, you know, how can we? manage that. And so we'll look at um, smart growth for as, as one strategy. And smart growth is both a regional strategy, but it then also can be a design strategy. And we'll look at critics of, of some of these strategies too. You know, so what's um, what is smart growth and what did, what can we do to um, institute these in policy and planning and design and why, you know, why doesn't it happen? So there's, you know, again, we're asking questions about this and we'll be critical and try, try to be able to talk about these issues. So when you leave the class, you'll be able, um, be able to be an advocate for sustainable cities in, in whatever capacity you wanna be. Um, but, you know, there's oftentimes 
misnomers about smart growth, but one thing is it's not, it's not just about getting everyone to live in the city. Um, it's really um, about wise use of resources in a lot of ways. And then it's also about choice, you know, providing better choice. Um, we'll also look through the lens of economics and sustainable economics. I'm not an economist. So again, we need, need some business students or um, some sort of like, um, economist to help us out here. But we can look at, and others have done this, that evaluated um, cities in terms of their revenue, in terms of um, real estate dollars, in terms of de development from an economic standpoint, and what's really sustainable. Um, and I, I think it'd be interesting to look at some case studies and see, like really break down the financing of this over time, if we can get, get a hold of those numbers and combine that with you know, a, a designer and an artist. And it, then you're talking about sustainability, right? So we're, we'll look at definitely from um, an economic standpoint. And that, by the way, this study that, uh, this slide that um, is shown here is looking at property tax revenue on a per acre basis. And oftentimes what we realize is that um, traditional urban fabric or downtowns and sometimes even just strip malls are generating a lot more revenue on a per acre basis than big box retail like a, a Walmart or other um, or Home Depot. And so if we, um, th there's different ways to evaluate it, but if we're looking at long-term economic viability and sustainability, um, urban form does matter. And, you know, thing, it, it's connected to how we um, tax things as well. Um, look at others, we'll look at some other strategies um, and see why they're, why they're potentially good and some of the critiques of those as well. So urban growth boundaries, um, for example, in Rhode Island and Portland and other areas where they work um, why they work, why they don't work, um, and why they're not instituted. Um, we'll look at some other techniques like transfer of development rights, um, which is a, um, in a nutshell, sending development rights from one parcel to another parcel, and typically one owner or developer to another in a city um, to help add density in one area and preserve um, rural, typically rural. Um, landscapes in another area. So, you know, so these are, there's some planning strategies, um, but it'll be interesting to um, dive deep and see what has worked, what hasn't worked, and how could, how could things potentially change. Um, we'll look at increasing, you know, things like increasing walkability, why that matters, and why it so often doesn't hit the mark in a lot of, um, communities. And so we, we design sometimes for walkability and plan for walkability, but it doesn't always work like we think it will. Um, and <clears throat> part of that is you know, evaluating places like this. So this is, this is a popular meme that's gone, that's circles around in planning and design and urban design circles, but you know, it's, it's telling. So we can really investigate why do we have these two different types of streets in our cities? But, you know, why, why, does, you know, so why do so many of our streets have um, streets that require a, a speed limit sign? Um, ideally, they're just designed so you, you're compelled to drive at a speed limit that's safe or that's appropriate for what kind of street it is. So we'll investigate why this is, why, you know, what aspects of this design make it so you, you don't want to speed and what uh, on the bottom picture and why do you want to go above 20 miles per hour in that residential area on the top picture, but also what policies, what zoning and um, what kind of engineering is in place to incentivize the, the image on the top and de-incentivize the image on the bottom, even though most of us like the image on the bottom more. And we'll um, investigate and try to dive down into that um, a little bit more deeply. 
Um, there's other tools we'll look at. Some of these are planning, you know, planning tools, but we'll investigate them and critique them and see see what where they failed. And I think some things like transit-oriented development, which is in a nutshell development that's as, as it's um, states here, it's oriented around transit. So it can be a, a really strategic approach in planning and development. However, um, there's a, sometimes it falls short, and there's and sometimes it can hamstring different communities that have it. And we'll we'll talk about where it works um, and why sometimes it doesn't work. And what's interesting is we have um, some a few decades, well at least a couple decades, of where we've seen some of some of this development happen in the U.S. and others um, other countries as well, where it has and hasn't worked. And so we can look at some precedents and. Say, well, okay, let's ask questions and really critically evaluate this and think about what what are some guidelines for going forward. Um, there's other design strategies. Some of these are borrowed from European context, but things like shared streets. Um, we'll look at um, and critically evaluate. And this is this is another one that is going to take a multidisciplinary approach, but um, the missing middle problem that we have in the United States, and so we have. Um, you, you might hear this come up a lot in conversations about urbanism, but we have a, a, a lot of single family housing in a lot of our cities and mid rise housing and apartment buildings, multi family apartment buildings. But we've let a lot of our mi what, middle housing or missing middle housing go. And so things like multiplexes, town, town homes, um, bungalow courts that were pretty common in the late um, 19th and early 20th century became um, not only out of style, out of fashion, but downright illegal in some places, right? And so, and this has to do with, it's not just the design of cities, but it also has to do with what's financed and what's insured and, it, it, and then what zoning allows for as well. So it gets, it can get kind of complicated it, um, but there's people that are saying, hey, we can, this is part of the solution to sustainable urbanism. Um, we can critically evaluate the, um, the one solution to this that was done in, or going on in Minneapolis is that they've, they're, they're now allowing um, single family homes to build up to a triplex um, at, across the city. And so this can add um, density at an incremental level and has potential benefits, but it really, it hasn't taken off so far. And part of that might be due to COVID, but um, we can critically evaluate what's missing with some of the initiatives to include missing middle housing. Um, here's some examples of infill housing. That's some people might, might conceive of, but still single family, it's um, considered missing middle. Um, and then we'll also critically evaluate the word density. Um, there's a great book called Visualizing Density that um, offers different views of different levels of density across the, particularly across the U.S. Um, but we'll look at this word and what, th what this means and why it really um, raises the hairs on people's backs when we start to propose density. So we'll, we'll not only look at ways to visualize density, but how density can be pleasant and how density can be accompanied with amenities and how density, um, I'll look, maybe it can be sustainable in some ways, doesn't always fulfill all its potential. And so, and then of course, there's what we call nimbyism, not in my backyard. A lot of people, um, and I've, my colleague, Carl, Dr. Carl Smith and I have found that a lot of people uh, and other researchers have found this as well, that people are for density, but not if it is in their own neighborhood. So we'll, we'll um, talk about the density issue or the, the D word. So um, in the last um, couple minutes, I just want to just give you a visual of some other ideas. And this, this was from a course um, I taught a couple of years, or taught it a few times, but it's um, that, that looks at retrofitting suburbia. It's called incremental sprawl repair. And this is work done by a former student, Tamara Stewart. And she um, 
took chapter five of a book called Retrofitting Sprawl by June Williamson and looked at some different techniques. So this is one example of sustainable urbanism where people are looking at some of the landscapes we have and the cities we have and retrofitting them to be more compact, climate sensitive, pedestrian and bike friendly, accessible to multiple generations and to, to everyone, and hopefully responsive to um, changes in demographics. So um, to go through fairly quickly, but um, some of these tech, and by the way, there's also critics of this, of these techniques too, of this um, sustainable, um, excuse me, of suburban retrofitting techniques. But, so that's something we'll evaluate as well. But you know, some of these techniques are reusing the big box um, in various ways, so the mall, sometimes it's just mall retrofits um, and reusing parking lots and filling those in. Sometimes it's environmental repair that involves the hydrologic system and, and landscape architecture and engineering coupled with urban design um, and mixed use development. And so these, these things go hand in hand. Um, and, and sometimes it has to do with revising codes and public work standards. Sometimes it's really about more bottom up approaches and what, what we sometimes call tactical urbanism and incremental approaches uh, and citizen activism. And these are really, these are really great at creating, oops, um, creating um, temporary public spaces that sometimes turn into permanent public spaces in back ways and pedestrian ways. So we'll look at some of these techniques as, as a possibilities um, for really strategic and incremental sustainable urbanism. Um, they talk about different techniques in this from an urban design perspective too, keeping things walkable and not designed to the car, but actually designed to the human scale. Um, street types um, and connectivity for drivers, bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, and then adaptations, you know, how can your city adapt? I think this is something that really all cities of all scales are going to have to wrestle with is how do we adapt over the next, over the coming decades to become more sustainable. And that also, um, one of the big takeaways too from um, June Williamson's work, but other work as well is that choice um, is really important. And we see that in all our great cities in the US where we have, we have great urban amenities and they're sustainable in many ways, but um, housing choice and price is really um, not adequate. So a lot of people are priced out of, of a lot of our cities like San Francisco and New York, for example. Um, so how do, how do we mitigate that? And then other things like that can be more controversial, but it sometimes can be um, really lovely is adding to things like existing single family subdivisions. How do we do that? Um, it's a design issue, but it's also a policy issue and gets into a lot of other facets. So ultimately, um, this course in the fall is, it, you know, it's about this question, how can, we'll, we'll learn about these issues of sustainable cities, but how can your discipline and your perspective tackle interesting and urgent city issues? So how um, how might you do that? And it doesn't mean we're, we'll be able to tackle every issue, but we'll, we'll have, I think, a, a lot of great conversations. And the, I think the, the more people or the, the more variety of majors and perspectives we have, um, the better and more robust the conversations will be. So um, there are some resources here that are useful when we're talking about sustainable cities. Um, you can maybe access on the, on the video that will be uploaded. Um, and for the students out there, remember to, um, if you're interested, apply to the Honors College application form um, by March 31st. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Billick, for that wonderful 
uh, overview of the seminar, the historical deep dive, and the peek into the future. Really, really appreciated it. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn the control over to our Honors College Ambassadors, Maisie Kennedy and Duru Urkan, who are going to monitor the chat and call on people who might have questions. So if you have a question for Press Professor Billig about the class or the subject broadly, go ahead and uh, raise your hand in the chat. I mean chat, raise your hand on the um, Zoom. You can also put your question in the chat. So we're looking for questions now. Where's my... All right, we've got one now. Um, so Austin is asking, what did you learn about sustainable cities and development while in Istanbul? Um, that's a good question, Austin. So I, I lived in Istanbul for two years and um, in 2000, from 2006 to 2008 and well, it's it's incredible because it's a it's a mega city, so it's you know the population is anywhere from twelve to twenty million, depending on who you're asking. <laughs> so it's a, yeah. but you can you can easily say it's about fifteen million people. So I learned um, how complex a mega city is and how crazy it is in some ways. But I think um, a couple things I learned was that. It's the human scale really matters, and Istanbul has has terrible traffic. It has um, it's noisy in a lot of ways, but the but there's a lot of great pleasures too, and a lot of that has to do with how people how people design their shops, how people design open space, um, even if it's in a um, kind of a what seemingly would be a chaotic perspective compared to like a Western European country, it's still very human scale. Um, the other thing I, I studied though, while I was there and studied for my, um, ultimately for my PhD dissertation was um, three informal settlements in Istanbul and on the European side. And that was looking at it from a, from a generative urban design stand, um, perspective. And again, it found um, it found that these, from a socially sustainable perspective, that the informal settlements, at least the ones I studied, um, were pretty sound. And Istanbul, at the time anyway, fifty percent of the housing was technically informal, um, but sometimes it was hard to distinguish what was informal or squatter settlements versus not. And it was really they have so much informal settlement. It's so many informal neighborhoods because of government policies dating back in the 50s and 60s that allowed this to happen and it was a way to accommodate people moving to the cities for opportunities um, but what happened was is in a lot of these neighborhoods infrastructure was retroactively placed so people built it and not just their own homes but the roads and a lot of the, the open spaces that are there a lot of the activity happens on the street. So it's very, um, it's a very vibrant um, uh, street life where a lot of conversations are happening and there's a lot of social capital, but it's cool because a lot of them have infrastructure retroactively installed like paved roads, buses that come through, you know, electricity, sewer, internet, uh, you know, all these things. So it's really part of the city, but it, um, it, which is sustainable, but it's at, at the human scale, that's pretty, um, can be pretty lovely. Not to say it's not gritty, but it's, it, um, that part's really nice. Um, one thing though, Istanbul's changed a lot though too. There's a, there's a lot of development that's um, really not sustainable, I don't think in the long run. And 
and they've destroyed a lot of their forests on the northern side, um, putting in a third bridge, and they've put in a new airport that also destroyed a lot of forests. So, and they put in a new um, mosque, Chamlaja Jami, which is also a um, on a hill that used to be um, forest. So they've done a lot of things that are not sustainable from a policy standpoint, but um, at the per, at, at the community scale, you still find a lot of um, good good aspects of urbanism, the kind of stuff that Jane Jacobs was talking about. Uh, but you don't see the green infrastructure like you do in other, you know, like in Copenhagen or or Portland. Um, oh, what I see another question from Eugene. Is it? Could, could you discuss further what is meant by nature deficit disorder? Um, so, yeah, there's a there's a book called um, Last Child in the Woods by Richard Louvre, um, written about 15 years ago, I guess, and 10 or 15 years ago. He talks about how we're we're losing access to nature, and these are you know, kid, he has you know the anecdotes of kids that don't know where carrots are, you know that carrots come from the earth, and we he's it was really a call to action. Um, the last child in the woods was a call to action that we that we and, and some people have actually named this a nature deficit disorder where we don't have enough time in natural settings or um, natural landscapes, and so. Some people associate um, our patterns of urbanism with nature deficit disorder. Now, a counter to that could be that some of our suburbs do have access to nature, but we've also, a lot of our urban patterns have paved over nature. And um, I think one thing landscape architects always try to um, promote is this idea that um, nature and urbanism are not to diametrically opposed things, you can have both. Um, I think of you know, when when I lived in Vienna, Austria, for example, and even though it's very dense in a in compared to U.S. standards, much of the city, I think over a third of the city is is put aside for parkways and, and other natural areas. So there's possibilities to have um, both good urbanism, but then also access to nature. So, and some people associate just the, the reliance on cars and having to drive everywhere um, to a disconnection from nature. And so, I, but anyway, I, I recommend um, Last Child in the Woods as a, as a good book to kind of dive, dive into that. Oh, I see a question from Dean Kuhn. Uh, what other majors? The, I, I think the door is wide open. I think every major lives in, a, lives in cities. <laughs> so I, and I'm sincere, sincere about that. I think um, I, one thing I didn't talk about today that I, I, re, I thought about this afternoon and then it was too late, but artists, like artists as, a, as key to making cities livable, right? Like in, making cities function, musicians, artists, um, engineers, business majors, health professionals, public health is key uh, to, to a, a sustainable city. So I, I think um, the, broader, the broader the range, the, the better. And if, if a student is questioning whether they, like maybe they think it's too far on the edge, they can uh, feel free to send me an email, but um, there's a lot of different possibilities for contributions. And of course, the, the Faye Jones School could, could have students as well. But I think it, um, people from Bumpers College, there's, a, there's um, hydro, hydrologists or lint, um, and all, I mean, full, all kinds of people from the humanities as well. It, and I, I think sometimes we, um, by necessity, um, 
people who are in things like planning and design, we paint broad brushes to, so we can get to work, make, having normative action on, on a city. Uh, but we need people to, you know, tell us to you know, step back a little and let's let's dive a little deeper. So a historian. Oh yes, always. <laughs> I love that idea of peopling your table with all kinds of contributors to the urban world of the future. That's super cool. Well, and I think it it gets to the point, you know, one of the bigger discussions we'll have too is that the primary one of the primary benefits of cities is that you know they're they're you know they set you free, they put they put you in the, you know. City air makes you free, isn't that a, what the Germans or someone used to say? So it it puts you in contact with people you wouldn't otherwise be in contact with. It puts you in it in access to opportunity and and um, both like minds and unlike minds. So it's it's um, that I think we could have a mini city in the seminar. No, this was fantastic. What do you do with, I have lived through six invent, reinventions of downtown Little Rock in my lifetime, I think, none of which um, succeeded. So in a city with limited capital that has urban renewal, failure burnout, where do you start? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, in it, to me, it's a part of it is is reprioritizing. So part I, I always say like start at the local level, but it also has to be at the federal level. So we there's so much so many subsidies. Um, and this might get in the weeds a little bit, but there's so many subsidies for things like transportation infrastructure, and we, you know we had just had, and you know my my I, this is my opinion, but that there was what I think was an ill-advised expansion of a freeway recently through Little Rock. And that's money spent, right? And, and from a local perspective, it might be money that they wouldn't otherwise get because a lot of, and I don't know what the federal match was on that, but a lot of times that's one of the problems that we've had is these policies post-World War II have had a lot of federal subsidy where sometimes it's an 80-20 match where federal government will be paying 80% and the local government plays 20 and it's a, oftentimes a use it or lose it scenario or they compete with other municipalities for it. So to me, a lot of it happens at the federal level where they reprioritize how things get spent and how transportation funding gets spent. Um, and I think, you know, we saw that with, I forgot his name, but there was a one of the um, transportation secretaries under Obama was very um, focused on environmental justice dollars being spent to try to ameliorate some of these the legacies of transportation infrastructure. So to me, I think there's there's a federal level changes, but then other the other pieces at the neighborhood scale and making sure that when there's um, reinvestment that it it doesn't leave certain people out. Right, so if there's redevelopment like on South Main Street in Little Rock, for example, um, how do you do that? But but involve all the neighborhoods, and it's tricky. And I I think it's really hard because it's I mean it's a wicked problem, right? Because sometimes these um, um, reinvest in downtown strategies that have happened over the last few decades. Um, are lim are limited in their scope, and part of that is because we've just so we've invested so much money in sprawling out, and that doesn't have it just isn't the recipe for good urbanism in terms of providing the tax base and the economic vitality, um, and you know things like walkability beyond little niche sectors. So even even some of the sustainable suburban retrofit, some that I showed at the end, some people criticize those and say that those are just little boutique projects that are isolated in the larger uh, matrix of suburbia. And 
And so some of the best projects are still surrounded by areas that are unwalkable. But I, I mean, it's a, you know, part of the, I think part of the beauty of this course is I, I'm looking for answers <laughs> too, <laughs> because it's a big, it's a big question. And I think it's a, you know, like it's not, there's not a, a silver bullet answer of, of how to do that. I see we have a question from Kendall Curley for you. It says, do you have a favorite city? One that you think is truly sustainable, livable, socially just? She always mm. asks these questions. I, boy, that's a, I like, I like to travel and live in different places, but I mean, I, I feel like Minneapolis is my home, even though I've, haven't lived there for 15 years. That, that'll always be my favorite city in so many ways. And I, I think from a open space standpoint and a social justice standpoint, they've done a lot um, that, that's sustainable and continue to push for that, um, even though they're not there completely yet. So I think I, I really like Minneapolis as, a, as an American example um, that's doing a lot of things that are that hit all aspects of sustainability. And I, I, I think your question's interesting because I, I really love living in Vienna and they're doing a lot um, in Vienna and other parts of Austria to create really economically and environmentally and in some ways socially um, just cities, but um, it doesn't have, so it has all of that, but it doesn't have the um, quite the after moving there from Istanbul, it didn't have the the street life of a place and vibrancy of a place like Istanbul. So I think the beauty of cities is there's there's no one that's perfect, um, and each one has some aspects that are um, maybe more sustainable and some that aren't. Um, of course, I I think Copenhagen and Amsterdam are both doing a from what I, from how what I understand, and from what I visited, in both of those cities, they've they're doing a lot of amazing things at both the policy point, but also from a design perspective as well. All right. Well, I'd like to thank everybody again for coming this evening. Really appreciate it. We had a great audience. Um, so I hope to see you all next week. Same time, same bat channel for Professor Kari Vantan, who's going to give a sneak preview of her signature seminar, Black Utopias. So check out your newswire tomorrow at the University of Arkansas website. We'll get a beautiful overview of Black Utopias. So let's give Dr. Noah Billig our big honors college. Who's up? Who's up? I want to sit in on your course. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Love Very it. Much. The deck. Great slideshow. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, ambassadors. Appreciate you being here. Everybody have